The second half of these other senses notes are going to focus on taste and smell. Um, so tastes, technical pronunciation, if you will, in terms of sensory experience is called gustation. The way that we're able to taste something is because of the taste buds that are on our tongue. Technically speaking, their name is papillae. Uh, it's a very strange terminology, but your taste buds are essentially just neurons. They're nerve fibers, sensory fibers, that transmit information from the tongue to our somatosensory cortex to experience the taste, whether it be salty, sweet, bitter, or sour, to our brain. We say taste because flavor is a very different experience, and we're going to talk about what that means in a bit. But it's very important that you make sure that you notate for yourself that taste does not always necessarily mean that we're discussing flavor. So very important you keep that in mind. One other bit to keep in the front of your head when you're talking about taste is the concept of a normal taster, a non-taster, and a super taster. For a normal human being, you have 10,000 papillae on your tongue, 10,000 taste buds. For a non-taster, they have exponentially smaller numbers of taste buds on their tongue, and so things taste very bland for them. They don't have nearly the kind of um, strong taste that they, something would necessarily for someone who is a normal taster. A super taster, has six times the number of taste buds that a normal functioning human has. So they have 60,000 taste buds. So things are really strong in terms of taste. So something that's you know sour to you, like a lemon head, exponentially more strong in terms of the sour experience for that person. So that is that aspect of taste. Traditionally, taste sensations consist of sweet, sour, salty, and bitter, but it's important for our purposes in AP Psychology that you are aware of two other taste receptors. The first is umami. Um, they believe that this is typically what's able for us to um, experience the flavor in juices, um, typically where, where meat is concerned, um, and astringent. So, um, you know, for example, if you get something like particularly bitter and sour, like a, you know, a combination of those, um, if you were ever to example, for example, get, um, accidentally get some of your, um, you know, uh, face wash that control, that contains a, um, an astringent for acne or for, you know, clearing that up, um, you'll get kind of a really strong bitter, um, metallic -y kind of sour taste, and that's what astringent is. For smell, technical term for this is olfaction. It's very similar to the chemical processing of taste in that the information is transmitted via neural fibers to the brain and then processed in that manner. For smell, there are basically 10,000 different odorants that are out there in the world as pieces of stimuli that our nose can detect. That information will enter through your nasal cavity and it will attempt to stimulate in this area 5 million receptors that are dedicated to the sense of smell and the experience of it. So you can see here the you know neurons that are presented within the uh, brain structure of this diagram, how we are able to go about experiencing smell thanks to our brain and how it interprets it. We've discussed in past class periods the link between smell and memory. We talked about it in Unit 3 when we discussed the hippocampus. If you look at the physiological location of where memory is established in your temporal lobe and where olfactory sensory experiences come in through your nose, you'll see geographically that they're fairly close to one another. So the brain region that's in red that is designated for smell is closely connected to the brain region of your temporal lobe that enables you to establish memory, particularly the hippocampus, and then translating it into long-term memory. So that's why oftentimes strong memories have a tendency to be pulled up for us because of our sense of smell. 
you've heard me allude to the fact that for me, anytime I smell anything remotely close to what is included in the uh, aftershave Old Spice, like the old guy Old Spice stuff from the 80s, not like the new stuff that they make those funny commercials for, instantaneously I think of my dad. And much of that is because of the fact that when those um, sensory receptors were taking that information in, they were so close to my temporal lobe and where memory is established, and so that's why they're so uh, heavily interconnected. I alluded to the concept of flavor earlier when we were covering gustation. Flavor is not the same as taste, okay? Taste is the experience of sour, sweet, bitter, and salty, along with umami or astringent, now that we know those terms. Flavor is the interaction of multiple sensory experiences. So to truly experience the flavor of a strawberry, for example, yes, you'll get the taste of salt. Yes, you'll get the taste of sweet and possibly a little bit of you know, sour involved in that. But you're also going to involve smell in your experience of flavor. And we'll do an activity in class that will really demonstrate this for you. The other thing to keep in mind is texture on your tongue. It wouldn't feel like a normal strawberry to you if that texture wasn't there. Another way to take a look at it is if I were to give you frozen chicken noodle soup. So you know the grease in that soup is kind of congealed and it's frozen and it's in a solid form. If I were to just present it to you like that, most of you guys would kind of gag and you'd be really grossed out and you'd just be like, oh, Miss Roland, what are you doing? So texture matters when it comes to our experiences of producing flavor as well, just as much as sense does, and just as much as our ability to pick up um, the six different receptors of taste. One last thing to discuss with you is body position and movement. These are sensory experiences, so it's important to keep these in mind. A quick little heads up that it, it is going to be very easy for you to confuse the two concepts that I'm going to discuss here. But we are going to try to further your understanding of how these two work independently and together in a class activity. I can't tell you what it is because it needs to be kind of a bit of a surprise. But the sense of our body parts position and movement is called kinesthesis. Okay? One way to help you remember that people who are hands-on learners are considered to be kinesthetic. So you like being able to take things apart, for example, or work with your hands because that's a way for you to be able to remember how a particular thing is processed or how our bodies function. So when we did the activity of brain day and you being able to physically see and touch the brain and its various structure parts, that for you was beneficial because you're a kinesthetic learner. Another kind of body position and movement sense we have is our vestibular sense. The vestibular sense is located in your inner ear, so this is what helps you with balance and body position, particularly where your head is concerned. So this would enable you, for example, to you know, walk along a wire because you have strong levels of vestibular sense in your ear, inner ear helping you to maintain balance. So as I said, we'll do an activity where these are uh, concerned to help you further understand it. But obviously, even if we get to that point and you're still not having um, success in being able to remember the difference between the two, please come see me.